My wife Sue and I recently moved to Millville, but I already regretted my decision. The house we bought was in a nice neighborhood, and the Florida weather was fantastic. Why then did it bother me that we had made a mistake by moving? In the three weeks since we moved in, two neighbors had been brutally murdered. Before buying, I had taken the time to look up crime statistics in Millville and couldn't find anything that concerned me. There was a murder a few years ago when a jealous husband came home from a business trip and found his wife unconscious in bed. It wasn't too bad, but she was covered in love bites. Next to the bed was the wallet of her husband's co-worker. The enraged husband quickly grabbed his .44, drove to his co-worker's home, and shot him in a fit of jealousy. Just last year, a man, outraged that a neighbor had run over his expensive bicycle, knocked on his neighbor's door and shot him when he opened it. I could understand a random crime of passion in any city, but the two recent murders were quite different. Bonnie Lasky, a middle-aged wife and mother, lived just two blocks from our new home. At least she used to live two blocks away on Beach Street. She was buried after a casket closing ceremony last week. Her husband found her bloody body in the marital bed when he came home from his night shift. After a short search, police found her head in the backyard. Two nights ago, Jack Hurley's neighbors called police because they heard blood-chilling screams coming from his home. When the cops arrived, they had to break down the door because Jack wouldn't open it. When the cops went to the bedroom, Jack let out a few final sobs before dying in front of them. The paramedics who arrived on the scene were unable to save him. This may have been because Jack's insides had been ripped from his body and placed on a pillow next to his head. In both cases, the police searched the neighborhood thoroughly. They even brought in a couple of sniffer dogs, but they came up empty. Several neighbors heard the horrific screams and looked out their windows, waiting for the police to arrive, but no one saw anyone leave Jack Hurley's house. Needless to say, this was very disturbing to me. I decided to install cameras in our house in the interest of safety. I thought about telling Sue about the cameras, but I was afraid she would get even more angry if she knew I was so worried. I could view live video from the cameras installed in every room of my house from my laptop and phone. I hoped this would give me the ability to see any threat before it was too late. I've never been a gun owner, and keeping a gun in the house would definitely upset Sue, so I declined that option. However, I wasn't completely defenseless. A few years ago, a business partner from the Middle East gave me a yacht again. I liked it a lot, so for some reason I started collecting different kinds of swords. Now I had rapiers, palashes, several sabers, a few yacht agans, and one saber. The house we moved into was a large Victorian house. It was in excellent condition, and much of it was original. Unlike many Victorian homes I've seen over the years, the owners of this house had never lowered the ceilings, paneled the walls, carpeted the wood walls, or ripped out the wood paneling. We had four bedrooms, four bathrooms, a library, living room, kitchen, dining room, and two rooms that had no apparent purpose, as well as a large attic. I hung my sword collection on the walls in various rooms throughout the house and spent quite a bit of time memorizing their locations. Sue thought I was just too proud of my collection. Our two children were grown and living on their own, so she wasn't worried about the kids playing with the weapons. I placed them high enough to make them inaccessible to small visitors, so Sue allowed me my whimsy. We were young retirees, and renovating the huge house was our main activity. We painted the walls, polished and painted the wood paneling, and threw out a few dilapidated pieces of furniture. I secretly placed cameras in every room. I was pretty sure that Sue would never discover the cameras. I made a habit of reviewing my footage every day to see if anything unusual had happened. The cameras picked up movement and only recorded what was happening in the room. A week after Jack Hurley met his untimely demise, Luke Baker's body was found in his living room, his office, and his bathroom. Rumor had it that a small red object lodged 30 feet away in the oak tree in front of his house was his heart. Our police department called the local fire department to retrieve the object. The firemen just took one look and told the cops that they, that they didn't have a car with a tall ladder, so they would have to climb the tree. Plus, pulling possible body parts out of the tree was not part of their job description. After much debate, the city rented a scissor elevator, and a young patrolman went up on it to retrieve what was in the tree. He put it in the cooler before returning to the sidewalk. 
A few hours later, I was on the phone with local law enforcement explaining my situation. I recently installed some surveillance cameras in my home and saw something that might be of interest to the police. We're very busy investigating three brutal murders in the city. I don't think we have anyone to watch your home movies, was the response of a bored woman answering non-emergency calls to the police department. Your bosses have requested anonymous information that might shed light on these very murders. I think I have it. Send someone to 423 Hickory Street. I'm Bill Macy, and I have information that might interest the police, I insisted. Wait a minute. You gave me your name and address, so it's not anonymous, replied the genius on the other end of the line. I was extremely frustrated by this point, but I managed to keep my cool as I recalled tidbits of information I'd heard about the local Flatfoots. I'll take a dozen jelly donuts and 12 cans of Bud Light with ice. That might interest a few ruminants down there. You're asking for Detective Cook? He's probably watching porn while he waits for his shift to end. I'll pass on your message, the woman promised me. I decided to take a leak while I waited to see if the cops showed up. I was washing my hands when the doorbell rang. I opened the door and saw an unassuming man in a shiny, badly rumpled suit on the doorstep. Are you really the police? Was my first question. Do you really have donuts and beer? Was his instant answer. It depends. I answered cautiously. Can I see some identification? It depends. The scruffy man objected. Can I have a donut and a beer? Okay, come on in. The donuts and beer are in the kitchen. The guys I met at the local watering hole described you pretty accurately, I admitted. At least they were right about the donuts and beer. I'm still a little skeptical of your crime-solving abilities. Fuck you, too. The man smirked opening a beer with one hand and shoving a donut into his mouth with the other. I'm Detective Cook. I shook off the bits of icing sugar that flew out of Cook's mouth and landed on my forehead and shook his hand, then brushed the jelly off my palm before turning my attention back to Detective Cook. It's a small town and a lot of people are jealous of my deductive reasoning abilities, Cook explained. Could you please let me know what information might help our investigation in solving the recent murders? Answering Cook's question, I pointed to my laptop. I moved into this house about a month ago. Shortly thereafter, the murders began. I was... Are you going to confess? The excited man asked. Damn, I think I've solved another mystery. No, I mumbled. I installed a surveillance system in the house because of all the murders in the neighborhood. I didn't tell my wife, who is shopping now, about buying the cameras. I would appreciate it if you would keep this information to yourself, unless, of course, it leads to the arrest and conviction of the killer. I expect to get ten grand if it does. I'm afraid we don't pay for anonymous reports, the fat bastard replied without blinking an eye. I see. In that case, consider this a tip from Bill Macy at 423 Hickory Street. Or would you rather not see the possible evidence I have? Is that how you're going to play it? said Cook with a slight jelly chuckle. Okay, Macy, show me what you got. I opened the laptop and opened the video files. First, I scrolled through a short clip of a dark, beast-like creature emerging from a closet in one of the extra rooms in my house. The next camera captured the same creature as it furtively made its way through my home office. It stopped to cast a brief glance at the calendar on my desk before leaving the room. In the next shot, the same creature came down the stairs, approached the front door, and cautiously opened it. Damn it, Cook exclaimed. Kate Upton? Your wife? You lucky bastard! That's the problem. I've never been in a state like Kate Upton, I replied wistfully. You mean you don't know Kate Upton, but she was naked in your house? What about that big fucking dog? Is that yours? Cook asked. I don't have a fucking dog, but it wasn't a dog. It was Kate Upton, I tried to explain. I may not know much about swimsuit models, but I can tell you this. Kate Upton is not a damn dog, blurted out Cookie. I should have you locked up for that one sentence alone. Watch the video again, I insisted, going back to the first video. If you look closer, you'll notice that the creature coming out of my closet appears to be walking on two legs. As it descends the stairs, it gradually morphs into Kate Upton. He looked at her picture on the calendar in my office before he started down the stairs. How the hell is that possible? How is it possible that her breasts haven't sagged? 
Cook asked, snatching the mouse from my hand and scrolling through the last ten seconds of the video a few times. We need to look in the damn closet. What kind of shit did you get yourself into? I led the cop upstairs to the closet room where the creature had appeared from. What are those scratches and dents on the floor and wooden walls in this room? The curious detective asked. This room smells like dog shit. Yes, it does. We're working on it, I admitted, pointing to several boxes of baking soda standing around the room, along with air fresheners and a bottle of Febreze. The previous owners wouldn't let us see this room when we looked at the house we were going to buy a few months ago. They kept the door locked, but we could hear the growling and barking of two what seemed to be very large dogs. Once we closed on the property and entered the room, we realized why the sellers didn't want us to have access. It smelled much better now than when we bought it. Cook nodded, looking around the room. And what are those big knives on your walls? What are you, some kind of ninja? I collect swords. This is a Yadigan forged about a thousand and a half years ago, I bragged. It's very rare. Whatever you say, Cook muttered, pulling out his gun and slowly opening the closet door. I reached out my hand to turn on the light in the closet at the same time. Cook bounced back and whined. What the fuck are you doing? I'm all tense with a loaded gun in my hand when you decided to turn on the light when I stuck my head in there. You go first, asshole. With those words, he jerked the door open and pushed me into a three by 10 closet. I had checked it after watching the video so it didn't bother me. I stepped aside and watched Cook look around carefully. He ran his hand along the wall and stepped to the far corner of the closet. He then placed his hand on the back wall and slowly ran it across the surface, moving closer to me. Suddenly, his hand disappeared into the wall. Cook let out a curse and quickly yanked his hand away. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. There wasn't a single hole where Cook's hand had been. He looked at his hand and then shifted his gaze back to the wall. Very slowly, he ran his hand along the wall. Again, it disappeared all the way down to his wrist. This time he moved his hand horizontally about three feet before his hand made a slight sound, hitting something hard. He then lowered his hand and it bumped into something solid again. He then moved his hand, apparently without a brush, until it reached about three feet of wall and again bumped into an obstacle. Cook pulled a felt-tip marker out of his pocket and shook the cap off it. He placed the marker on the wall and carefully moved the marker along the wall just a few inches from the hand he was moving inside the wall. He got to the far side, went down about three feet and then back up to me for another three feet before moving the marker back on the wall to where he had started marking. Suddenly he gave a startled shriek and quickly pulled his hand out of the wall. Blood was oozing from a cut on the back of his previously invisible hand. I think one of those bastards clawed me or something, the burly detective said too calmly. What bastards? Where did your arm go? How did you manage to punch through the wall so easily? What the hell is going on? I asked a little nervously. I could be wrong, but it looks like you have a closet with a portal to a parallel universe, Cook replied. It's too early to say for sure, but it's entirely possible that the creature that came out of here is our killer. That doesn't make any sense, I protested. I've never heard of a parallel universe. Is it from outer space or something? It could be from some planet light years away, but I suspect it's a portal to another dimension. Scientists have been arguing about the existence of other dimensions for years. String theory allows for 11 dimensions, Cook explained. Where the hell is the guy who ate my donuts and drank my beer? I growled. What are you, a fucking theoretical physicist or something? I wish I was. I'm just a fan of the Big Bang Theory. Cook admitted, seeming deeply thoughtful. I'm going to nail that wall down, I declared. I'll take three quarters plywood. Those bastards won't be able to break through it. No good will come of it, said Cook. There's a wall there now. Portals to other dimensions can't be blocked like that. They allow passage through solid walls, even concrete walls. Are you saying walls aren't effective? I asked. Try telling that to Hannity. Why the hell haven't those damn things been killing people for years? Why did it start when my wife and I moved? It doesn't make any sense. I bet the previous owners knew something was wrong here. 
That's why they locked the big dogs in the next room. Any one of those furry bastards walks into that room when a couple nasty Rottweilers or Dobermans are patrolling, and they, they're their food. Explain how these furry bastards, as you call them, can turn into Kate Upton, I demanded. That stunt would be worth billions on the open market. It's very likely they're werewolves, Cook reasoned. And what the hell are werewolves, and what do you mean by they? Do you think there's more than one? Now I was getting really worried. They're like rats, Cook replied. If you see one, it means you have an infestation. There's probably a lot more where that hairy bastard came from. Can I call an exterminator or something? Should I get a couple big nasty dogs? What can I do to keep safe? I whined. Don't panic, Cook warned. We can't be sure this is a portal to a parallel dimension. We don't know if there is more than one bloodthirsty ghoul in your house. We can't even prove that a naked Kate Upton killed that poor lucky Luke Baker. No wonder there was a big smile on what was left of his face. He died with a smile? I asked in surprise. Yes, can you think of a better reason? What would you do if a naked Kate Upton appeared in your bedroom? Well, I'd have to feel those amazing breasts. Probably play with. That was all I had time to do before Cook interrupted my daydreams. Exactly. You'd be grinning from ear to ear. If she ripped half your face off, it'd be a crooked grin, just like Baker glued what was left of his mug. You're just making me feel a little better, detective. I live in a house where demons come out of my closet. What am I supposed to do? We need to make a plan, Cook said firmly. I suggest you keep the closet door locked, just like the door to this room. It won't stop the ugly bastards, but it should slow them down. Plus, the noise they make breaking down the door should alert you in time to run like hell. You're a real fucking piece of work, I growled. I go to the police to keep me safe from those damn werewolves, and you tell me to run like hell? That's your plan? You could try putting pictures of Don Knotts and Pee Wee Herman in a prominent place. Cook suggested. You could kick their asses. Is this a goddamn joke? I asked angrily. No, I thought it was a damn good idea, objected the enigmatic Detective Cook. Likewise, avoid pictures of The Rock, Chuck Norris, Clint Eastwood, and my personal favorite, John Wayne. I can see how that idea makes some sense, I reluctantly admitted. Any other brilliant suggestions? Could you make it so I could see your security system in real time? I could follow him and rush over here if it looks like another spawn of Satan has shown up. Yes, I can share the video with you on the cloud. I'll give you access and you can watch the video and see the action in real time. That's a surprisingly good idea. Detective Cook hung around for a few more minutes discussing various ways to catch werewolves before they killed anyone else like Sue and me. He took my last two beers and the donut I was saving for Sue as he left. While waiting for Sue to return, I googled some notable people and printed out their pictures. First I went with Don Knotts and Pee Wee Herman, and then I went with Joe Pesci, Danny DeVito, and Woody Allen. I pinned the photos to the wall of my office. I admitted to myself that I was grasping at straws. Now that I knew there were murderous demons rampaging through the house, it wasn't easy to act normal around Sue. It was likely that she would overreact to this information and want to sell the house. If we sold it, we'd take a big financial hit and our retirement plans would go down the drain. If Cook and I could figure out how to keep those bastards from coming through the wall, or if we could domesticate the damn things, we'd be fine. Two days later, while standing in line at Home Depot for paint, I decided to check my phone to see if anything was going on at home. I started to get a little excited when I saw Sue walk into our bedroom naked. She was still a beautiful woman of about 45. Her breasts were high and firm, and her ass was perfectly rounded. I was admiring her body when a man entered the room to join her. I was stunned and only slowly began to realize what I was seeing. It was me in the room with Sue. I checked my phone to make sure I wasn't watching an old video, but to my horror, it was happening in real time. I saw Sue fall to her knees in front of me. Yes, it had to be a werewolf. I dropped the paint I was holding in my hand and ran to my car. Breaking the speed limit the whole way, it still took me ten minutes to get home. I rushed inside, grabbed my favorite yacht again off the living room wall, and ran up the stairs as quietly as possible.
The door to the bedroom was open, so I just walked in and picked up my yacht again. I hesitated as I watched Sue and my double come to the finish line. What if it was a person who was a clone or a twin with Sue? He definitely looked human. Hell, he looked exactly like me, only with a flatter belly. If it was really a man, I'd commit murder. If it was really me, I'd kill myself. I was out of my mind, literally. My decision was made for me when Sue let out a loud groan and seemed to pass out. I loosened my grip on Sue's hips and she fell forward, clearly comatose. And then it happened. I watched as hair began to grow on my ass and back. It wasn't me. The transformation happened surprisingly quickly. Within seconds, I was already watching a dark, hairy, beast-like creature pulling long claws out of its hands or paws or whatever it was. It was preparing to strip my emotionless wife on her ass. My razor-sharp Yadigan swung down and sliced the demonic bastard in half. When both parts of his body hit the floor, they turned into piles of ashes and quite small ones at that. I was shaking at the thought of how close Sue was to becoming another victim. I was upset that she had slept so willingly and well with a werewolf, but how could I blame her? He was just a slightly better version of me, at least when it came to sex. I wondered if I'd ever be able to satisfy Sue again. She never passed out when we made love, but she lay there smiling like a cat that got the cream after that demonic bastard finished having her. It was the one time I outdid myself, literally. My phone chirped and I slowly picked it up. Jesus, that was really close. For a second there, I thought you were going to let that bastard rip your wife apart. Did you see that, Cook? Did you see how quickly he reverted back to his original form and how he was going to tear Sue apart? I asked, somehow feeling relieved that Cook had shared that experience with me, even if only indirectly. I saw it all. Did I just watch Bill 2.0 have your wife in a coma? Are your wife's breasts really that firm or was it some kind of spell or magic? You're missing the real situation, I shouted. My wife was fucked and almost killed by a damn demon from a parallel universe. Yeah, you're right, Cook admitted. Now I know how they work. Your wife has the same goddamn smirk that Jack Hurley had on what's left of his face. So what are you going to do about it? I demanded an answer. You can't arrest these bastards. You can't even catch them. Actually, we did have one arrested, Cook grinned. It seems Marsha Terrell was attacked last night. She lives a block away from you on the same street. She was in her bedroom talking to her husband on the phone when Don Knotts walked into her room, wearing nothing but a wide grin and flaunting an impressive erection for such a skinny guy. Marsha teaches some kind of martial arts class at IMCA. Needless to say, she was kicking the little guy's ass all over the room. Her husband called the cops while she was pounding the poor little bastard. When the cops arrived, he was unconscious. He was shape-shifting while they handcuffed him. No one knew whether to take him to the vet or the doctor. You said you had one in custody, which leads me to believe you don't have him anymore, I remarked. Did he kill the cops and escape? No, he turned into a little pile of ashes in Marsha's bedroom before they could move him. I think he died in prison. It usually takes a lot of paperwork, but we decided to pretend it never happened. Marsha was fine with that. She gave the boys a bag for the ashes. She didn't feel like explaining how she'd knocked one of America's favorite television personalities out of her mind. I'll be getting one of those camera drones later this week. I'll take it through your wall into a parallel dimension to determine the best way to deal with these illegal aliens or whatever they are. Just hold out a few more days and it'll be over. Seeing Sue stirring, I hung up the phone and walked over to her. How are you feeling? You fucked me senseless. I feel great. We'll just have to wait a few days to try again. I need to recover, my loving wife replied, kissing me with a deep kiss with lots of tongue. That was just great. I gave Sue the best sex of her life and just watched. It occurred to me that a recording of this session would be quite interesting. I would have to watch it quite a few times to recognize every move I made in this epic affair. There was no way I could fully get used to the fact that Sue had been fucked like hell by a guy who seemed to be me but wasn't. I felt it weighing on me somehow, and it annoyed me, at least until I got home from Home Depot the next day. I was back in line at the register with the paint I had tried to buy the day before. I decided to check my phone again. And again, I saw something amazing. 
Our neighbor, Agnes Murdoch, was a well-preserved widow in her fifties. She was nice enough to us except that she was always preaching religion and warning of all the terrible things that could happen to us sinners. Sue thought she was harmless and meant no harm by her rants, but I tried to avoid this woman. Why was Agnes sneaking down the hallway from our spare bedroom to the bathroom completely naked? Then I realized it was another damn werewolf. He must have looked out the window and seen Agnes doing something in the backyard and decided to take her form, only he had bigger breasts and a rounder ass than Agnes. I knew Sue was away for the day visiting her family, so she was safe, but it was still a dangerous situation. I hurried home and grabbed my trusty yacht again, which I put back in the holder in the living room. I was beginning to love this gift more and more. I silently climbed the stairs and crept down the hallway with my yacht again raised, ready to strike. Just as I reached the bathroom door, Agnes entered the hallway. She was wiping her hair with a towel. She was completely naked, and I had a chance to study her body. It was pretty damn obvious she was a werewolf. I raised the yacht again higher and tensed my nerves, studying the area of her neck where my blade would enter. Death would be swift and merciful. The problem with my plan was how human she looked. I couldn't kill myself when I slept with Sue because I looked so human and so much like myself. It wasn't until I started to turn into a monster and became a clear threat to Sue that I decided to swing my blade. I felt like I should do the same to Agnes. I couldn't chop to pieces what looked like a real person. But if I could make her turn back into a bloodthirsty beast, I wouldn't have such qualms. With the end of the blade, I pulled the towel off her head and tossed it aside. Agnes fumbled for the towel and started to turn her head to look for it. Then she saw me standing next to her, raising my saber threateningly. She gasped and trembled. Scared? I grinned as a plan formulated in my head. I know why you're here. You want hot sex and a big orgasm before you change your clothes again and eat me, don't you, bitch? Get your enlarged ass into that room and get on all fours on the bed. I'm going to fuck you like the animal you are. Saying that, I reached out and squeezed her breasts a few times. I pulled her and gestured to invite her into the bedroom. Agnes was still trembling when I nodded, indicating that I wanted her on the bed. She nervously climbed on it and leaned forward, presenting me with a truly wonderful ass. I realized that these werewolves knew how to seduce a man. I'd seen my wife defiled by a bastard like me, and I knew what demons liked sexually. They wanted it hard, fast, and rough. So I gave it to Agnes. The bitch loved it. I could see that she was close to a really strong finish. She seemed to have some serious little problems that were building up in intensity. I was starting to worry that I would explode before she did and pass out first. I was having the best sex of my life with a goddamn monster from another universe. I was about to explode like I had never exploded before. I had to hold out long enough to get Agnes off, see her turn back into an ugly fucking monster, and then chop her prim head off. Suddenly, the bitch started letting out an almost soundless scream. I'd never heard anything like it before. She pushed back hard. She started to shudder and then collapsed. It was the most incredible feeling I had ever experienced. Then I lost consciousness. Startled, I woke up. I was still alive. I was grateful to him for that. The werewolf had decided not to kill me. Maybe I had fucked him better than I ever had before and was going to let me live so I could sleep with him again. If that was the case, I was more determined to stay conscious long enough to separate his head from his body. Agnes was with me. The strangest thing was that she was still human. You said I should eat you after you fucked me like an animal, Agnes said with a smile. I hope I'm doing as well as you wanted. I don't think I can handle another sex like the last one for a few days. Oh, okay, was all I could utter, trying to make sense of everything. Agnes was still in human form. That's when I realized she was talking to me. I didn't know if werewolves could talk. Best laid plans and all that. It wasn't long and she talked me into another one. It was so nice of you and Sue to offer to let me stay with you while my house was being fumigated. Those termites were becoming a real problem. I have a question for you. Was this with Sue's knowledge and permission? Or have you been a very bad boy? I thought you were someone else. I mean, I didn't think you were really you. I had to find out if you were you, I blurted out, trying to explain the situation. I didn't think you had such a nice ass and those breasts were bigger and firmer than you. I see. 
You thought I must be someone else because my ass was so beautiful and my boobs were bigger and firmer than you thought. The only way to make sure I was me was to blow your brains out. Is that what you mean? Agnes asked, smiling broadly. That's right, I admitted. I have a feeling that Sue doesn't know about your decision to check my identity so thoroughly. Is that true? Well, she didn't say anything to me about you staying here, so she can't blame me for having doubts, I reasoned. Don't you think Sue would think that doubting is one thing, but having me the hell out of here is another? Do you think she'd be upset if we told her about it? Agnes asked with a silly smile. There's no reason to tell Sue about my little mistake. Heck, she made the same mistake, but she doesn't know about it. Let's keep this between us if you don't mind, I practically begged. I think we'll work something out. Every once in a while, I'll expect you to come to my house and check out my ass and breasts to make sure I'm really me. In exchange, I will never again preach to you or mention to Sue that you are having some sort of identity crisis that involves checking my ass, my breasts, and sexing me senseless. Do we have a deal? Okay, we have a deal, I replied with a smile. Who knew a prim, preachy bitch would have ass and breasts to die for? In my defense, most men in my position would have made the same mistake. I went to my bedroom to take a shower before Sue got home. I was brushing my hair when she came in and gave me a hug. Hi, stallion. I'll be ready for another round of this incredible lovemaking in a few days, but we have to make sure Agnes gets home so she doesn't hear us. That would be awkward. Why didn't you tell me she was staying here for a day or two? I asked. I told you yesterday at dinner. You've been so busy lately that you don't listen to what I say, Sue replied. Later that night, I got a call from Cook. Are you sure you want me to put an end to these furry killers and close the portal to another dimension? You're getting a hell of a lot of sex because of it. That Agnes has an amazingly beautiful bust, doesn't she? You fucked her like a bloody werewolf. You didn't know it, but I was gonna chop your head off if you turned into a demon from hell after you shot the lady. I was at your front door when I saw you both come out with wide smiles, but still in human form, so I went back to the station. You must have watched the video of your wife getting it on from that guy who looked just like you. You fucked Agnes just like you fucked your wife. My porn collection is improving dramatically. Why did you call, Cook? I growled. He's I want you to get your wife and mistress out of the house tomorrow so I can send a drone into the portal, see what's going on, and find a way to block it. You're getting very sensitive lately, Cook opined. Cook showed up the next day when Sue and Agnes were out shopping. True to his word, he brought the drone with him. He didn't mention that he was bringing explosives. I'm sending this drone with a hell of a lot of explosives. If I think I can destroy access from that side, I'll blow it up, the detective explained. Will the damn thing blow up my house too? I asked nervously. From what I understand, the explosion will happen either in the other universe or in the universe we're in. Either way, it shouldn't have any effect on your home or our world or even this dimension, Cook answered logically. We stared at the monitor as the drone flew through the wall of my closet into another dimension. It's hard to describe the colors and shapes we saw as Cook rotated the drone so that the camera could catch every detail. We did see some fuzzy bastards watching the drone fly by, and soon some of them took its shape, but apparently they couldn't duplicate the mechanical moving parts as the bastards just sat on the ground without moving. Cook brought the drone closer to the portal. On the other side of it was a wall in some kind of cave. And I'll just slip around the corner and detonate the explosives. That will prevent any flying shrapnel from hitting back through the portal. If I close the entrance to the cave, those bastards won't be able to get to the portal, he reasoned as he hit the enter button on his laptop. The image on the monitor disappeared. The werewolf's head suddenly rolled through the portal and disappeared into the closet. We felt the house shudder slightly, and then everything went quiet. The severed head turned to ash before it stopped rolling. Cook reached out and tapped on the wall inside the square he had drawn with his felt-tip pen not long ago. The wall was solid. The explosion had destroyed the portal. Eh. That evening, as Sue and I were getting ready for bed, she turned to me with an impenetrable expression on her face. I still experience some discomfort when I sit up. Today at lunch, I asked for a cushion for the chair. Agnes asked for one, too.